Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. It's easy to identify with the prophet Elijah's words this week. Elijah's fellow countrymen were sacrificing their own children to a false god named Baal. They were burning their children alive to their god and praising themselves for it. In this past week, the American media praised a pink-shoed state senator from Texas who filibustered a bill that would have made it illegal to tear a child apart in his mother's womb after 20 weeks. Elijah's countrymen tore down the true God's altars and replaced them with booths for temple prostitutes where they would worship their false gods through fornication. And this week, the U.S. Supreme Court emboldened those who seek to build those booths of fornication around us today and give them the state's blessing. They emboldened the growing voice in our nation that wants to silence the voice of the true God by hurling endless accusations of bigotry, and hatred at his followers. Elijah's countrymen were putting God's prophets to death. The Syrian rebels that our government armed and supported in the revolution last year, they're already using those same arms to murder your fellow Christians. But you'll find virtually no outrage over this in our nation, no media coverage, no congressional hearings. No one seems to care. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. It's easy to identify with the prophet Elijah's words this week. Jezebel was the unbelieving queen of Israel who helped lead God's people astray. She was a Phoenician princess who brought with her the worship of a false god named Baal. Jezebel was therefore a ruthless persecutor of the faithful, perhaps the most ruthless persecutor of the faithful that we see in all the scriptures. She despised the true God and wanted nothing more than to murder the prophets who proclaimed his name. She wanted nothing more than to shut the mouths of the men who spoke for the God who promised to send his son into the world to die for its sins. So Jezebel vows to put Elijah to death. That's why we find him driven out into the wilderness in our Old Testament reading for today. That's why he's hiding in a cave, terrified and trembling and despondent. In his sorrow, Elijah is worried that God has lost and Jezebel has won. And in our sorrow, we have the same worry. Here we are in our cave this morning, recognizing that no matter how many times we've pledged allegiance to, the, to one nation under God, so many in our nation pledge their allegiance to Baal. And the Jezebel in our midst boasts, boasts that she will hunt us down and destroy us. Jezebel promises that our sons and daughters will be embarrassed by our ignorance and our hatred and our bigotry. She promises us that all of our backwards views, all of our middle-aged morality, all of our Bible thumpery will be forgotten and left in the dustbin of history. Jezebel despises the true God, despises the word of authority that he speaks. Jezebel, even under the cloak of diversity and tolerance, will praise the false God who commanded the Hindus to burn their wives to death. She will laud the false God of the Muslims who commanded them to behead their enemies, and at the same time she will curse you for proclaiming the name of the God who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life amidst saying that you should love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How did Jezebel's voice become so loud 
and so angry so quickly? How has so much antipathy and hatred of the church just festered like this so rapidly? How, many, how have so many of our sons and daughters and friends and neighbors become a part of Jezebel's body and a part of her promise to see the Christian faith defeated? Well, the answer is simple. Because as sinners, we've all been a part of Jezebel's flesh. We've all lived in service of our own lusts and our own selfishness and responded in anger and cruelty when God's word has called us to repent. We've lashed out at our parents when they've told us that we were living in ways that are contrary to God's will. We've just simply dropped our friends when they wouldn't reinforce us and bless us in the transgressions that we cherished. We've quit our churches and grumbled against our pastors when they've preached against sins that we want to keep committing. That is, at its heart, all that Jezebel does. She wars against the God who calls her to repent. And that's what we as sinners do. So what you see going on in our nation now is really nothing new. It's just this same principle of despising the one who calls you to repentance, taken to a grander level. That's the irony of our current state. We lament the fact that the world has driven us out into the cave, but we voluntarily walked halfway there in the first place. And yet still, our sorrow is intense. And it's still easy to sympathize with Elijah's fear this morning. Because the world does genuinely want to destroy us. It's easy to worry that the faith we confess isn't going to survive another generation or two in this country. It's easy to worry that it won't be long before God's word condemning specific sins would get you thrown in jail for preaching it or get your congregation's tax-exempt status removed. It's easy to fear that God has lost and Jezebel has won. But she hasn't. Even if all the list stuff I just listed happens, even if the world tears our churches down and throws our pastors in jail and puts our fellow believers to death, even if all that happens, Jezebel has still lost. And she's lost in two ways. The first way is physically, or politically, I suppose you could say. So in our Old Testament reading for today, God comforts Elijah by telling him to get up out of his cave of fear and go anoint a man named Jehu to be king of Israel. Elijah does this, and a little while later... This King Jehu overthrows King Jehoram, who is the son of Jezebel. And then Jehu marches into the city, and he has Jezebel thrown out of a window where dogs end up tearing her flesh apart. So in her earthly life, Jezebel loses, and she loses spectacularly. But with an even greater victory, Jezebel loses eternally and spiritually. Those of you who have been coming to my Sunday morning Bible class may know where I'm going with this because we talked about it just a couple weeks ago. You see, before Jezebel was thrown out of that window, in fact, if my math is correct, even before Jezebel drove Elijah out to that cave, Jezebel had already lost. You see, before Elijah was in that cave, Jezebel had a daughter named Athaliah who married King Jehoram of Judah. And together they had a son. And he had a son. And he had a son who had a son who had a son who had a son and so on and so on until the birth of a boy named Jesus in Bethlehem's manger. Despite all her hatred 
and persecution and murder, God made Jezebel the great, 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 many times over grandmother of Christ. Jezebel sought the death of the prophets because they proclaimed the God who would send his son to die for the sin of the world. And yet, when that son took on human flesh, the flesh he wore was descended directly from Jezebel herself. Jezebel warred against the Lord with the sword, but God defeated Baal's queen with her own womb. And the fruit of that womb showed his victory and his mercy. Jezebel tried to defeat Christ by hating him. Christ successfully defeated Jezebel by loving her. On the cross, the fruit of Jezebel's womb did what she wanted to stop more than anything in the world. He died for her sins and Elijah's sins and your sins. By breaking open the flesh that he inherited from that wicked queen, Christ won for her the holiness that Baal could never give. And he won that same holiness for you. With bits of Jezebel's own blood, or own DNA in his blood, Jesus shed that perfect blood for the grandmother who hated him. And he won eternal life for her, for you and for me. On the cross, Jesus took the foot that was formed from Jezebel's own genetic material and he freed her from the power of Baal by crushing Baal's skull, the skull of the devil, the skull of this false god that Jezebel had served with murder and hatred. He freed her just as he freed you. Jezebel, however, wanted to remain in her slavery. And she wants you to remain there. That's why she drives you out into the wilderness today and breathes murderous threats against you. But as we see in Jezebel and Christ, when the world vows to defeat God, God raises up his own children from the loins of his enemies. And he overcomes the enemy's hatred with his children's love. So stop worrying about the way the world is going. Stop being afraid and come out of your cave. Go back to those, going back to those two ways that Jezebel lost. I can't and I won't promise you that you're going to see that first kind of victory, that earthly or political victory in your lifetime. Certainly the day will come when Christ returns and every knee of every king and president will bow before him. But as we wait for that day, I can't promise that you're going to draw your final breath in a world that cherishes the gospel. In fact, the world's probably going to get much more hostile towards the faith and towards the faithful in your lifetime. But what I can promise you is this. When Jezebel laughs and tells you that you're going to be forgotten by history, God will have the last laugh by again doing the same thing he did when he brought Christ out of Jezebel's womb. God is going to raise up children from the Jezebels of this world who will believe in Christ despite their parents' hatred. Their parents will mock them and ridicule them, perhaps even disown them, and yet their children will stand by their parents at their death and tell them that they're not angry because Jesus loves them, that he's freed them from the hands of Baal with his own blood, and that he wants to welcome these sinners into his arms. 
God is going to raise up pastors from the loins of those who tore down our churches. Pastors who will take the bricks that their mothers and fathers shattered and put them back together. And within those rebuilt walls, they will baptize and commune and teach their fellow Christians. And despite the hatred of their own flesh and blood, they will never stop turning their love away from the ones who taught them to despise the Lord. The offspring of those who took the lives of the martyrs are going to become martyrs themselves. The children of terrorists. The children of those who cut the heads off of Christians. Their children will boldly stare down the barrels of guns and they will stare at their own reflections in blood-stained machetes and swords and with their dying breaths they will do the opposite of what their fathers taught them. In their dying breaths, they will echo the words of Christ by telling those who are going to take their lives, I love you and I forgive you as Christ has done before me. Out of his love for sinners, and in order to show the Jezebels of this world that they will not and cannot defeat him, God will continue to dig his hands into the bloodlines of those who despise the gospel. And he will cover their descendants in the bloody gospel of Jesus Christ, which proclaims pardon and peace for even the most devoted disciples of Baal. No matter how madly Jezebel raged against God, God himself came out of her womb and defeated her with his love. That was the case in Elijah's day. And that's still the case today. So come home from your cave. Baal is dead. Christ is living. Jezebel has lost. And you've already won. Amen.